Hi, today we'll be looking at the forms, styles, and techniques of different adverbs and talk about what makes them successful and what doesn't. This first example is a car commercial for Volkswagen, in which its form is a realist narrative, as it is relatable and portrays scenarios that could happen in real life. This targets a family audience through personal identity. They use styles and techniques such as parody in order to appeal to their audiences through star appeal and humor to offer diversion. Volkswagen targets a mainstream audience through their synergistic relationship with Star Wars, which is one of the most successful film franchises. We also see the kid wearing a Darth Vader costume, which could be considered a risk on Volkswagen's part as Darth Vader is one of the most well-known villains. However, I believe that it only adds to the humorous aspect of the video due to the juxtaposition between the image of children, who are often depicted as innocent and sweet, and Darth Vader, who is evil. This particular shot highlights how it was a good decision, as the car is a lot bigger than the child wearing the Darth Vader costume, which in turn alludes to the fact that the car is bigger and more powerful than Darth Vader. Here is another car ad, but this time it's a little different. The ad is in the form of an anti-realist narrative, as it's quite stylized and unrealistic, and is aimed at a niche market unlike Volkswagen. This ad exaggerates the car's features, such as its speed and durability. The fact that the ad's form is an anti-realist narrative also alludes to the fact that this car is out of this world. This ad is filled with quick cuts and moving shots creating diversion, and keeps the audience constantly engaged. From the product, we already know that this is aimed at a higher demographic, as this ad shows that this car is a racing car and is not a necessity, but it also shows that it's aimed at a younger audience due to the diversion through CGI. I think the anti-realist take on this ad could be received in two ways. Either the audience is captivated by the anti-realist out-of-this-world feature that the ad is showing, or be disappointed that the real features of the car is hidden due to the overwhelming amount of CGI, and feel like the features of the car are blown out of proportion to the point where the product itself loses credibility. I feel like aficionados would particularly be disappointed with the ad, as they are unable to see the features of the car in action. This next ad is arguably one of the most iconic ad campaigns of all time. Created by Dos Equis, this is an anti-realist narrative series titled The Most Interesting Man in the World, focusing on a man reminiscing his old memories. This ad is in the form of a mockumentary, as while it holds the conventions of a documentary, with a voiceover and delivery of information, the information isn't true. Don't worry, this isn't false advertising. In fact, the exaggeration in the grandiose stories within this ad is what makes it so memorable. The use of the styles and techniques, humor and surrealism offer the audience's diversion, appealing to them. The ad campaign is obviously aimed at men, as the stories often include a hyper-masculine portrayal of the most interesting man in the world, with lines like, He wouldn't be afraid to show his feminine side, if he had one. His organ donation card also lists his beard. If he were to pat you on the back, you would list it on your resume. And is often seen with young women who are the standard of beauty in media today. So you could say that these ads appeal to men through the utopian theory by Richard Dyer, as despite knowing that these stories are unreal, it's something that they would want to achieve. However, you could argue that the flaw of this series is its controversial portrayal of women, as it often objectifies them, making them subservient and taking away all their agency. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer those Zaki's. Stay thirsty, my friends. This line is quite interesting, as the face of a beer company states that he doesn't always drink beer. But I think it was so successful, as it was consistent with the character in the rest of the ad. It seems obvious that the most interesting man in the world wouldn't constantly drink beer, as though he was a college frat boy. The nonchalance of this man gives a sense of elegance and class. This beer company is appealing to men through this idealized version of masculinity, and it verges to the point of anti-realist narratives. According to senior brand director Paul Smiles, when casting the most interesting man in the world, what Dos Equis was looking for was a lead actor for a campaign that would break the beer advertising mold. While so many spots featured pretty women and exotic locations, the Dos Equis team discovered that more than anything else, drinkers really wanted to be seen as interesting by their friends. By casting an older man, they were really able to show this without making the younger 
audience feel hostile, but rather make them admire and aspire to be like the most interesting man in the world. Dos Equis later changed their spokesman to a younger actor hoping to attract a younger audience. However, by doing so, it caused a lot of backlash, as the original series was so iconic and successful, the abrupt change was hard to accept. And it went against their original marketing plan, where it would be an older man in order to stop the audiences from comparing themselves to the character. Additionally, after convincing everyone that Goldsmith's character was the most interesting man in the world, it seems a little contradictory to bring in a new actor while the original was still alive. I feel that some connection between the predecessor and successor would have made this campaign more successful. This video is an example of an ad in the form of a documentary, as the ad is convincing us to buy this product, which in this case is a shoe made out of plastic from the sea, through surveillance, offering information. They also use the form of animation in order to create diversion. The ad style is dramatic, as the voiceover highlights the issue of marine pollution and it also uses quite strong words such as killing, grabbing our attention through guilt tripping. It also tells the audience how it's affecting them, using personal pronouns saying, we are feeding ourselves our own garbage, making the audience more likely to pay attention through shock. They then use this shock and offer a solution, making the audience who see this ad think that their shoes are the solution to these environmental issues, making them more likely to buy the product. However, while suggesting this, they don't explicitly say it within the ad, which stops any controversy regarding false advertising. There is also synergy between Adidas and Parley, an organization dedicated to raising awareness for the beauty and fragility of our oceans, making the ad more credible and potentially appealing to a larger audience. Have you ever looked for a hotel online? Did you notice that there are so many different prices out there for the exact same room? Here's another form, the talking head. This is an advert of a hotel app, Trivago. There is direct address and the speaker breaks the fourth wall, establishing a connection with the audience. They attempt to appeal to their audience through personal identity, making the presenter wear a very casual button down and jeans. However, it has the risk of making audiences feel that the informality was overdone, making them feel like the presenter isn't committed or bothered to sell the product. They also include animations within the ad in order to help create diversion as the audience is able to follow along through the visuals. Personally, although it could be made to work, I don't think that talking head ads are as successful as other forms, plainly due to the fact that there isn't as much to grab the audience's attention and keep them engaged. When it comes to nostalgia, one of the quintessential examples are Christmas adverts. This particular example was created by Marks and Spencer, in the form of an anti-realist narrative, as they are playing with the idea of Santa Claus. This is unlike the anti-realist narrative of the car advert, as it's less flashy and almost seems like it could be a realist narrative had Santa not been a fictional character with a fictional job. The use of Santa Claus, an icon of Christmas, helps to appeal to a family audience. However, we could say that using Santa Claus could create controversy due to media invisibility, as some people who celebrate Hanukkah may feel like they are not being represented. From the beginning, there is a quiet and peaceful score, ambient sounds of the cracking logs from the fireplace, and a warm palette, as Mrs. Claus helps Santa Claus get ready to deliver presents to children. Their dialogue makes them feel more human and relatable, appealing to audiences through personal identity, then, further into the video, there is a cutaway to a letter addressed to Mrs. Claus, and when she replies to Santa's question, any last-minute requests, she lies, replying with, oh no, just spills. This engages the audience through diversion, as the Barth's Enigma code suggests that texts create a sense of mystery to draw an audience in. After Santa flies away on his reindeer, which indicates the form is an anti-realist narrative, Mrs. Claus returns to her letter, and a voiceover of a boy reading his letter begins. We then see him writing as well as flashbacks to keep the audience engaged and perhaps appeal to the audience through personal identity, especially those with siblings. We then cut back to Mrs. Claus scanning the letter to find his location, making it more realistic through a modern twist. It also creates enigma as we begin to wonder what Mrs. Claus plans to do. We then see product placement as Mrs. Claus wears Marks and Spencer clothes as her own version of the Santa suit. When her dress is revealed, the score changes, becoming more dramatic, emphasizing the importance of these dresses as though they are superhero suits. She also brings out a present for a boy who seemingly annoys her sister constantly, creating enigma. She is also seen riding a snowmobile and helicopter. This also creates the association between Marks and Spencer and being modern, as Mrs. Claus is a lot more gadgety than Santa Claus, 
as well as an association to comfort as she is able to ride snowmobiles and helicopters in her clothes. When she arrives at Jake's home, there is a cutaway of a roof and a mid-shot of an amused Mrs. Claus creating diversion through humor. And when the next day comes, the ad reveals that the present was in fact a gift from the little boy to his sister, and the voiceover resumes, revealing that the boy does love and care for his sister, creating this alternative representation for lots of little boys, and associates Marks and Spencer with love and family, appealing to the family audience. The mystery of why Mrs. Claus was willing to give a present to the little boy is answered and also discredits the idea that naughty children don't deserve presents because all children have their own side of the story, making it a quite heartwarming message. At the end of the ad, there was also a direct address establishing a connection between the viewers and the character, and in turn, Martin Spencer. This ad is also in the style of a parody, as it has a modern twist built into it and focuses on a more underrated character, Mrs. Claus, which would appeal to a female audience through personal identity, as well as the fact that they are being represented in a folklore that was male-dominated. I think the decision to create an ad based around Santa and Mrs. Claus was a smart decision, as Marks and Spencer is suggesting that their products are gifts and are associated with this idea of giving and having the ability of satisfying people's wants and needs. 